everybody. Welcome to On Two Spirit Identity and Cultural Expression. My name is Alex Elliott, and I'm the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, which, as you may know, is a nonprofit university located in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those who were forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramaytush Ohlone lands. If you're interested in learning more about Native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Before we jump into the conversation tonight, I have a couple of general tips and troubleshooting items to go over. For those of you who are watching live tonight, we will have a live Q&A after the conversation. So please submit your questions at any time using our web form, which is linked in the event description just below this video. Our presenters will be pulling questions that were submitted on that form after their talk, and then we will try to get through as many as we have time for. We do have automatically generated captions turned on for this event, which you can toggle on and off for yourself using the closed captioning button right in YouTube. If you're having any issues with your audio or your video, we always suggest that you first reload the page. And then if you're still having issues, you can adjust your video settings right in YouTube. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, Roger Kuhn and Landa Lakes, and then we will get right to their conversation. Dr. Roger Kuhn is a Porch Creek Two-Spirit Indigiqueer Soma Cultural Sex Therapist and Sexuality Educator. Roger's work explores the concept of decolonizing and unsettling sexuality and focuses on the way culture impacts and informs our bodily experiences. In addition to his work as a licensed psychotherapist, psychotherapist and ASECT certified sex therapist. Roger is a faculty lecturer of American Indian Studies at San Francisco State University. He is a board member of the American Indian Cultural Center of San Francisco, community organizer of the Bay Area American Indian Two-Spirit Powwow, and an LGBTQ plus advisory member of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. Landa Lakes is a Chickasaw writer, musician, activist, and artist. As drag persona Landa Lakes, she founded drag performance groups in San Francisco, including the Two-Spirit Native American drag troupe, the Brush Arbor Girls, and the creative and campy House of Glitter. She's also the West Coast mother of the Vogue House of Lauren International, and is the recipient of the national pageant title, Jewel of the Galaxy. Landa uses art to combine contemporary ideas with Native history and traditional stories to convey the shared experiences and understanding of human nature outside the col colonialized Christian perspective. Her notable honors include the New York Fresh Fruit Festival Performance Award, KQED LGBT Local Hero Award, and she was publicly elected as Grand Duchess 36 of the Grand Ducal Council of San Francisco, a nonprofit organization of which she now serves on the executive board. Recently, she co-founded the Weaving Spirits Native Art Festival, now in its third year. And now I am so excited to turn it over to Landa and Roger. Estonko Hesje, Nice to see and be with you all this evening, this afternoon, wherever you may be tuning in. Great to also be here with my friend, uh, Landa. Nice to see you, Landa. Hi, good to see you, Roger. Yes. Well, I just want to take a quick moment and introduce myself to folks, and then I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself. So as we say where I'm from in Muskoka, Estonko Hesje La Jadoga, Muskoki, Hokodoga May. My name is Roger Kuhn. I am a member of the Porch Creek Nation. I am from the Wynn Clan. And right now I am in Kumai territory, also known as Southern California, specifically around the San Diego region. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Land if you want to give a brief introduction to yourself and maybe name the territory you're on at the moment as well. Chukma Sochifoa Mingo Thomas Aminti Tupelo Chikasha Sea. Hi, I'm Landa Lakes. I'm from the Chickasaw tribe. I'm from the Tupelo community um, specifically. Right now, I am right here in San Francisco. So 
Yalamu is the traditional name that the Ohlone called uh, this area, and that's where I'm at right now. So I just want to acknowledge that. Wonderful. And for those that are listening live, if you want to know more about the native territory you are on, you can go to native-land.ca, enter in either your zip code or the town that you are in. And if you are in what is now known as North America, likely you will be able to learn more about the native population on whose territory you now are living on or visiting. So uh, you can always do that anywhere you travel. I always think it's a good idea to become familiar uh, with the native people on whose land you are on. Uh, so, Landa, thanks for being here. Now, for those that don't know, uh, Landa and I have known each other for quite some time. Um, my very first Two-Spirit Gathering that I ever went to um, back in Oklahoma, um, probably in the early 2000s, maybe, uh, Landa was one of the first folks that uh, introduced themselves to me and welcomed me into the community. And when I moved to the Bay Area, Landa was also there for me and uh, welcomed me back into the community here in the Bay as well. So an honor to be with you as a friend. And I'm also here as a fan. I am a fan of Landa Lakes. And so I want to just chat with you a little bit tonight and uh, really learn from you about how you have used your art as a platform and a pathway to activism. I've seen some of your performances and um, they speak to so many issues impacting Two-Spirit and Native and Indigenous peoples, not just here in the US, but really across the globe. Uh, and I've also been a, a fan of the subtlety of your art. I think you do, your, your style of drag for me is um, deeply political, deeply artistic, and also incredibly humorous and funny, and also sometimes really touching. So if you would share a little bit with us about your idea about art as activism. Art as activism, you know, it's, it's, it's actually one of the reasons why we created the Weaving Spirits to, um, Two-Spirit Performance Arts Festival is because um, we, we do have this platform of, of drag and it is, and it does give us that ability to uh, formulate ideas such as like, you know, what's actually happening within the Native community. Um, currently, when you look at um, what's going on right now, ICWA is sort of in the news because the Supreme Court is looking at it. And, and, and it's actually something that touches a lot of indigenous people's lives, um, yes. much more so than a lot of people, a lot of people would know. Um, even within my own family, we have, um, you know, children that have been taken away for one reason or another. And unfortunately, um, the the sad part of uh, things that that happen within like my, my home in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm is that there is a lot of drug abuse. There is a lot of uh, drug abuse. So, you know, sometimes the social services will step in and they'll take the child away. And when they take that child away, um, then it is up to us as a political body, not as just being the race of being like uh, Native American, but as a political body to have a say in where our children are going. Yes. And, and it's very important for us that they stay within our culture. And so when children are taken away, we sort of want to ensure that they stay within our tribe. Hmm. Or if, if they can't be within our tribe, then maybe um, with, with other native people, just, just something to give them pride. Unfortunately, you know, um, sad but true, once upon a time, a lot of people were really encouraged by the Christian churches to go out and adopt children. And, and they did that. They did that not only here in the US, but also in Canada. And, and they went out and they adopted them and, um, and brought them into their families and didn't really give them a lot of instruction on, you know, what it was to, to raise up an Indigenous child. And, and, and so quite often these children felt alone mm -hmm. and different and, and not really fully a part of, of the family. And so when you look at something like that, then you can say to yourself, how can I put this into a performance? Mm. Because I want to tell people about it without also giving, uh, without you know, uh, giving them like this boohoo sort of a sort of a story, mm -hmm. but just to just to enlighten the audience in some way of of something that's happening. And I think that's what um, it's great about drag is like it's it's a platform, regardless of how you see it. It's it's a platform that you can go ahead and you can talk about these issues, these really tough issues. Um, and ICWA is one of them. Missing and murdered Indigenous women are, is one of them. You know, there there's a 
lot of things that affect us as Indigenous people. And we want to be able to um, get that off our chest sometimes. And and the best way to do that is 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 through performance because I I believe that's what art is really about. It's yeah. it's about love. It's about pain. It's it's about all those things. And anytime you have an art form, um, I think it's your responsibility to go ahead and um, let other people know what you're doing or how you're feeling, so that they can also relate to it in some way. Yeah. Uh, ICWA, for those that are listening, stands for the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was established here in the United States, and I believe it was 1979, 78 or 79, uh, late yeah, 1970s, it was 79, um, and that's currently, um, there's a case currently in the Supreme Court that's being argued right now, um, which is uh, really about sovereignty, right, in many ways, you know, ICWA is about sovereignty, not just a racial issue, this is a sovereignty issue for Native people as well, and, and self-determination around our our uh, members of our community, et cetera. Um, your name in and of itself uh, is satire, political, and also, um, I think, a very activist perspective. And would you share with folks a little bit about uh, the story of your, your name, Landa Lakes? Sure. I'll, I'll start off by saying that, you know, I didn't initially start off as Land Lakes. Initially, when, when I was doing drag, I was known as Autumn Westbrook, which is a very pretty name. Very pretty. <laughs> um, Miss and, Autumn Westbrook, would you have a Southern Autumn accent? Westbrook. It sounds very Southern, you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, that's, that's how I started off in Oklahoma, you know, very, very pretty and everything. But then um, when I was out here in California, I wanted to have one that was a little more campy, but also had a political edge to it. And of course, Lando Lakes Butter has this little in indigenous mascot, or used to have this indigenous mascot on the front. And I wanted to sort of poke fun a little bit at that mascot. Uh, so I, I took on the moniker of, of Lando Lakes, which inspired people to give me all these, this Lando, Lando Lakes merchandise <laughs> and everything. And I was just, I, I was always like, oh, well, Thank you, but I don't really support <laughs> of a mascot. You know, that's what my name is really about. It's, uh, it's it's about making fun of it, and and even when they removed um removed the indigenous person from from it, there is there is a little bit of controversy about that too. When mm -hmm. when they removed it from from the brand, um even even among some indigenous people, some indigenous people want it to remain because like an indigenous artist did it but I always figure it like this okay if if, if you're going to use our image as as indigenous person how do we benefit from that you know how do we benefit from that I can see how you benefit because mm -hmm. it, it it gives you a sense of Americana yes. you know this is homegrown mm -hmm. sort of that's that's the great use of an indigenous mm -hmm. mascot is you know this you know we're you know homegrown we're Americana but where does it benefit the indigenous person? I think that once upon a time when um, we didn't really have much representation in the media or anywhere else, there might've been a time where we as indigenous people were like, oh yeah, I'm so proud to mm. see this mascot here, this mascot there. But there's so many things that that sort of like come off of that that is just not good um, when you have an have a school that might call themselves the Cherokees and then uh, the opposing team will put up signs that say we're gonna make you walk the trail of tears right. you know a very serious thing and right. and everything you know that's that's some of the some of the issues that we face with mascots is yeah. you know and even the the tomahawk chop yeah. You know, yeah. that was terrible too. You know, there's there's a lot of terrible things that come from mascots themselves. So I I enjoy using the name um, mm -hmm. because it it does make people think about it. And um I just, you know, for me, I think it's important to to say that I don't really approve of mascots um from living people, from living people. I would I would rather you go with a, a color <laughs> or something like that rather than rather than a living culture. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I was thinking about how um 
you, you were talking about like, you know, the, the, the usage of mascots and the, the character. I, I, I guess that's always a question I've, always, I've been curious about. Is Landa, is Landa a character or is Landa a part of personality? I'm, sometimes I'm not sure how to like uh, address folks who do drag as art. Is, it, is, is, is Landa something that's a character if I were to say like your character Landa? Um, I would say that if what, what we usually refer to it as our, our drag persona. Persona, um, okay. Our, our persona um, is just that sometimes people sort of like don't necessarily fall within that line of like separation between um, the persona that they've created yeah. and themselves. And, and that sort of blends and sort of merges and so forth. That's why a lot of times when you'll see me at like the powwow or something, when I'm bringing in a flag or something, you know, they don't introduce me as, as Landa Lakes. They, they go by my name, Miko Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, rather than that because because and in those moments i am i'm not a character i'm not this persona yes. yeah. i'm myself mm -hmm. oh that makes sense so the persona landa lakes in terms of uh, bringing that awareness to the activism within even something like mascots right and you were naming um the trail of tears and for folks that may also not be a, a, aware of uh, sort of geographical locations of uh, native nations, Landa and I are from a similar region. Our tribal nations are from a similar region uh, in what is now called the United States. And um, uh, of course, our peoples were deeply impacted by the Indian removal policies of the United States government in the late 19th century. Um, and I was thinking back to the Weaving Spirits Festival that I witnessed a couple of years ago, and you did such, I'm still, I think, digesting it artistically, powerful, uh, story that um, you you brought in some of the Brush Arbor girls that were a, a part of that story, and um, within that story, what I was really intrigued by was your artistic use of uh, indigenous narrative, uh, weaving um, uh, what I would say anthropologists or would sort of call like folklore uh, into a story, and also using. Um, a really challenging issue and to deliver it to an audience in a way that was my word here, but like digestible for them. And I, I wanted to know if you could share a little bit about that experience, about that creating of that experience for folks. Yes, well, when I when I create something, a lot of times it it, it really does have to come from from me and 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 from my culture. So a, a lot of times when you'll see like one of these type of pieces, then I will be bringing in um, some of um, my Chickasaw identity in some ways. And, and, and in this particular story, um, I really wanted to, to convey this idea of, of the spirit world and that, you know, whatever we, what happens to us in this life you know, there is that that next step afterwards. So it was sort of like like a closure in a way. So it was it, it was like a repeating circle that yeah. went from from point point A all the way back to point A again, um, back back into the spirit world. And so with that story, we just followed the life of 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 this two spirit person that was born and then later on um, became one of the murdered and missing indigenous women. And um, and then her journey afterwards. Yeah, yeah. That um, it, it, as an audience member, it was profound. And MMIW, uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, two spirits, and people is such a epidemic within our culture and our community that is getting minimal attention um, more in the larger political landscape. Um, and the festival that that was that the first time it debuted? It debuted at the, the Weaving Spirits Festival? Yes. Yeah. Um, which I have had the honor of being a, a participant of. I was, I was a, a, a performer a few years back. Um, and I can tell you that those types of experiences are rare where Two-Spirit folks have an opportunity to get together and, and share our art with each other and with an audience. You and I participated in something like that in our youth back in New York City. Um, mm -hmm. And I know we've also both separately been a part of the Two-Spirit Cabaret that's out of Toronto with the, um, a theater group up there. And now you're doing something here um, alongside a, a co-curator with you, Javier, 
uh, in establishing this Weaving Spirits Festival. And I'm curious if you can share a little bit around your vision behind the Weaving Spirits Festival and any plans in the future about what we may uh, see soon. Sure. Um, well, well, to start off with, um, you know, I, I'm always a, a strong proponent of creating Indigenous spaces because so often within the Indigenous community, we find ourselves being the one person, mm -hmm. being just like that solo person, the one person there. So when I created something like the Brush Harbor Girls very early on, we created our first like Indigenous drag space. And that was 18 years ago. And, and, and that was pretty amazing in and of itself. So then when we, we came forward, um, me and Javier were talking after a, um, a powwow meeting, our two-spirit powwow meeting. And, you know, my thing is like, I always want people to feel welcome and belonging because I didn't always feel that way in the past. And so I wanted to make sure that we have like a really welcoming spirit and to be able to um, highlight Indigenous people. And we were taught, me and Javier were talking, and I sort of like said, yeah, this is what I see. This is what I picture. I would love to have like this two, uh, two spirit performance um, space that we can really highlight um, Indigenous people, both local and some that's um, out, outside of our territory. And before I knew it, Javier had found a space or had found a grant and said, okay, let's do it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so, you know, we we were able to uh, come together and and pull everyone together. But I think I think I've probably been heavily influenced by um Hane Gigama, who who mm. is, who's a playwright. He he organized a lot of different things in in, in his lifetime. And he he's he's retired, but he used to work down, I believe, at UCLA. Um, but what what I really remember from him is early on. I remember this thing called the New Indians, which was um, which was a script that he that he had written, and um, I, I was still in high school and and I read it and it, it was pretty amazing to me because it was like all indigenous theater. It was a whole indigenous in theater ensemble, and he had sort of he had, he had sort of created that. And outside of that, he also created the American Indian uh, the American Indian Dance Theater Company as well. Mm. So um, a lot of people are familiar with that. And he's, he really created all these like, like little things. So for me, it seemed like it was important for us to create a performance festival, just highlighting two-spirit people. Um, you know, it's, it, it's one thing to be the one indigenous person in the room, but it's also another to be the one indigenous plus queer person in the room. <laughs> yes. So, so so it was it was really amazing that we were able to do that. And um, we were able to invite that first year to get a lot of different artists to come through and and perform for us. And now we're looking forward to our future festival, um, which is going to take place in April of next year. And and again, we want to feature artists that I think can really tell really, really cool and interesting stories. I love to be able to spotlight people and give them that opportunity that uh, they may not necessarily have, or they're going to be in a, another festival that, you know, they're, they're sort of like the minority person in that, in, in that festival here, they're spotlighted. Um, they, they're, they're a huge part of it. And, and, and I think that's important, you know, quite often indigenous people are invited places to give a land acknowledgement. And once they've done their land acknowledgement, where do they go into the shadows and they disappear? <laughs> yes. You know, it's like, it's, it's like, wow, that sounds like uh, the Chickasaws in Alabama, Mississippi, in Mississippi and um, Tennessee, we all just sort of disappeared. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you, well, I will look forward to uh, seeing, I think I've seen every show that you've done, all the, all the Weaving Spirits uh, festivals. I think I've been to all of them. Last year's was really, really uh, incredibly powerful. Uh, and then I was just, before we got on live, I was just talking about, um, Dr. Jennifer Lisa Vest, who was on uh, the Weaving Spirits Festival, who actually was just part of public programs a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so a lot of these communities are all linked together. And, you know, I love that there is this Weaving Spirits Festival because when you and I were 
uh, younger and back in New York and, and, and we did that show. It was part of the Fresh Food Festival. I, I don't remember, was it called the Two-Spirit Evening or something like that? I don't yeah, it's the Two-Spirit Evening. Two-Spirit Evening, I think that was called. And it was really nice. And it was like, wow, that was really, really cool. And I had, I think I had just met you shortly before that, or maybe we'd known each other about a year or something like that. Yeah. And I, I just remember thinking like, oh my gosh, Land of Lakes is coming, how exciting. And um, now to see the weaving spirits here in the Bay Area, it's also really refreshing um, because when I think back at, back in the day when I was more active in the music world, I often felt like what you described, like, wow, I'm the only indigenous person here. I'm the only two-spirit person here my goodness, the, the representation, the weight of the representation that I feel. And I, I oftentimes, you know, my genre of music that I was doing was, you know, what folks would call Americana music. So folks would think that they're getting an indigenous musician and have this expectation that I was supposed to show up with the hand drum and sing powwow songs or start singing hand drum songs. And it's like, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a crooner myself. Um, so now when I see the Weaving Spirit Festival and I think, oh my gosh, there are so many people that are open about their identity and they're returning to uh, the two-spirit tradition. It's so beautiful to see and to witness uh, as an artist and also as an audience member. Uh, I wanna take a quick moment though. I'm realizing that there may be folks here tonight who don't even know what you and I are talking about when we say two-spirit. Um, so maybe just a, a quick little uh, aside. Um, and I'm curious if, if you wanna define um, how you uh, view the word to spirit and maybe how and or if you identify with that word? For myself, yes, I do identify with the um, with the term to spirit. And for me, to spirit may not mean the same thing for for different people. But for me, it it usually means that I fall within that umbrella of the LGBT community. But it also means that I have a spiritual side, a spiritual connection. So when, when you say two-spirit for me, I think of people who are connected spiritually as well to, mm. to, to their traditional ways, or if not their traditional ways, then uh, ways that have been introduced to them um, as, as spiritual. And, and that, for the most part, is what sums up a two-spirit person, somebody who, who not only falls within the LGBT umbrella, but is also very spiritual as well. And so, and so there's practices that go with that. And of course, there is that um, feel of activism that usually comes with, um, with, with being a two-spirit person. But I think first and foremost, it's, it's, it's about that nourishment of your spirit. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, it, it was a term that was introduced in the early 1990s, uh, really as a way to sort of counter a narrative that was very popular in academic spaces and really a pejorative term that was used. Um, and really this group of um, artists, activists, leaders got together and said, we're not gonna take that anymore. We're gonna use this term and it, it's the term that, that caught on. Um, so for those that are listening to that maybe do not identify as indigenous, I always like to stress that two-spirit is our word. Uh, it is to be used with us um, and about us. It's not a, it's not a word to be co-opted and, and used for folks that are not indigenous. Uh, last week I was on a radio program and um, this cis white uh, presenter, you know, asked me, you know, is it okay to, if I use the term two-spirit? And my response was, well, um, you've taken our land, you've taken our culture, taken our language, and now you want to use the colonized term that we use to describe ourselves. You want to take that too? Um, and I think that she got it. Um, so that is that is our term, and I would just I will just stress that there are many ways to describe um, that beautiful rainbow spectrum that some of us may be a part of. And two spirit is our term. It is it is for uh, it was created by our community and it was really for our community. It is a way that I I, I also identify in the world. Um, and it wasn't until I myself learned about two spirit that I went oh, wow now I finally feel like I belong somewhere. Because in that LGBT plus uh, spectrum you talked about a moment ago, Landa, I often felt like there wasn't quite a place for me here, kind of is a place, and yet I'm different. You know, I, there, are, there are things about, I think, being Native, whether you grew up on the reservation or not, that is just an understanding that we have amongst each other. And um, being a part of Two-Spirit community for me was truly the way that uh, I felt 
I understood what love and acceptance was. And I feel that immensely when I'm at the Bates powwow. And out of everything that I've ever done with you as an activist or a community member or a friend, an artist, the work that you and I and the entire Bates community have done for the powwow has been one of the most touching experiences of my entire life. And I hold such gratitude for both you and Ruth for what you started, uh, the movement. We have two spirit, public two spirit powwows now literally across the US and Canada. It is so beautiful to see. And I'm wondering what that's like for you to one have started that, uh, that beautiful tra tradition we now have in the Bay Area as one of the founders of it. Um, and you've, you've been there ever since, every year you've been working every year. And also what's it, what it's like for you to see how you have inspired Two-Spirit folks across Turtle Island to do something very similar. Well, I'll, I'll first start off by saying that, you know, one of the things that that we built into the powwow from the very beginning um, was that welcoming spirit. You know, you're welcome here, um, regardless of your gender. You know, mm -hmm. if 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 you come and you identify as a man or a woman or uh, trans or whatever you are, we wanted to make sure that it was welcoming. And 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 one of the major players in that was that there used to be this powwow in Oklahoma many years ago. And at the time it was like, it was like huge. It was so big and it was called Red Earth. And, um, and it started off in the eighties and, you know, me and, me and my best friend, Russell Big Horse, we were excited to go and everything. But when we were there, we didn't necessarily feel welcome. We, we, we didn't necessarily feel welcome there. Like, you know, afterwards, you know, going clubbing or something like that, then yeah, we were very welcome, but we just weren't a welcome site. Mm. at the powwow mm. and so you know when when the two-spirit powwow began that was our, our our main thing was like it it has to be welcoming for all people we have to make sure that people feel this and i feel the same way about like the term two-spirit and when it came about and everything a lot of that had to do with you know going back and like you know nourishing your spirit nur nur nourishing your, your soul in some way because i think a lot of times when indigenous people leave their indigenous communities and come into an urban setting they feel a little not just lonely but also separated mm. from their ways and and their culture you know and that also is a separation from your family as well especially if your family is is, is a very traditional family and so this was a way to give back to the community and we didn't just give it back to um the queer community we invited everyone yeah. everyone everyone to come so they did they they just showed up some came and um and and some people came that had um lgbt relatives or two-spirit mm -hmm. relatives mm -hmm. and and they wanted to show that um you know they they were there to support and everything else so from the very beginning it was it, it was a welcoming space and that's how i feel every time i see it you know i feel like we've created something that is so welcoming that other organizations want to emulate it and bring their people back into into that circle that many of them may have already left yeah and, mm -hmm. and not really wanted to come back because of how it felt mm. once upon a time and, and and we're changing that and even here in the bay area sometimes at powwows you'll go and you'll see them carrying in like um a rainbow flag you know, that didn't actually happen before. And then you go and you look at um, Gathering of Nations, which is the largest powwow in the yeah. nation. And now it has a two-spirit contingent. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they have these things because they recognize that two-spirit people are still in that circle. We, we are still dancing with you. We've, it may have seemed like we left, but we haven't, we've always mm -hmm. been there. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think that's, that's very important. So I'm very proud of the work that Bates has done mm -hmm. in, in creating the powwow. And I, I have to say it, it touches my heart every time that um, we have our grand entry and I see so many people come out and from the very first, from the very first one, I remember someone telling me that um, when we brought in that rainbow flag at the very beginning at the, um, when when it first entered into the arena that that she just cried mm. 
you just cried. Yeah. In Muskoki, we have a term, uh, anokachiko, which um, when you translate that to English, it means uh, love, but it doesn't mean like I love you. It means uh, community love. And um, one of my decolonial acts is trying to learn as much of my language as I possibly can. Um, and that's one of the words I learned. And um, I remember being at Grand Entry a couple of years ago, probably like five or six years ago at this point. And um, at Fort Mason, where we hold our powwow currently, um, there's this really cool loft that you can walk walk up and see Grand. If you um, you're always in Grand Entry, I a few times have been able to watch it from above. It's such an amazing sight, uh, just to see all the people in that space. And at one moment, I remember filling with joy and just those tears of joy coming out. And I went, Anokachiko, this, this, this is what I have been trying to understand, Anokachiko. This is a community love right here. And I ended up doing my entire uh, PhD on, on the subject of two-spirit love, which was inspired directly from uh, what I saw at the Bates powwow. And also what I, you know, in general, what I've experienced um, with two-spirit community as a whole, that idea of like welcoming, um, Landa and I were also uh, together over the summer in Montana at the uh, Montana Two-Spirit Gathering. And what was not said in your bio uh, was your new uh, title that you, uh, were, I mean, really were gifted in, in a lot of ways, rightfully so, uh, which is now Miss Montana Two-Spirit. Um, if you could share a little bit about because I actually don't know myself, like what, what does it entail? What does it entail to be Miss Montana Two-Spirit? Well, um, Miss Montana Two-Spirit is a powwow title. So that means that I go out and I represent uh, the Montana Two-Spirit uh, Society um, at different powwows and different indigenous functions. And sometimes that's spilled over into, um, in, into other functions, sometimes queer, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 been very, it's been very cool and everything. You see, I didn't run for the title. Right. <laughs> I was, in, in Montana, I'm, I'm usually their NC for their, um, for their talent show night. And, and, and a part of that is usually the Montana um, contest mm -hmm. and everything. And it's just that um, the their committee met together and they decided to crown me as Miss Montana. So when when we went to the powwow, um, I was sitting there and they called me up and crowned me as as Miss Montana. And at the time, I I had bangs on and I knew that it didn't wouldn't look so well <laughs> with, with the crown. So I just snapped them off and put them on the former Miss Montana. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, and and so we we exchanged bangs and, <laughs> I, and and I took her crown. <laughs> uh, that was that was that was a really fun moment, and um, the entire room was just lit up with excitement when you were when you were named as Miss Montana, and no doubt you you will represent the Montana. Two spirit community and that powwow with love and grace, as I know you do with everything that you, that you have. And I'm remembering that night now. That was so fun um, because you and I like work a lot during the powwow, the Bates powwow. I rarely get to dance because I'm always like running around and I danced so much at the Montana powwow this year. It was so much fun. I even danced outside. It was, I just kept going. Like the drum was still going as I just kept going. It was so beautiful, so nice. Um, I was thinking about uh, when I saw you earlier in the week, I, I remember asking that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, sort of two-spirit elders. And in our community, uh, we have lost some dear uh, elders as of recently. And uh, I remember I had that conversation with you a couple of days ago. We're like, well, gosh, w w are, are we almost elders? I mean, are we are we kind of in that cusp of, of what that means? And you said something to me that I found kind of profound about your experience um, as, as a native person who uh, was raised traditionally and was raised with your culture and your language in a way that some of us were not. Uh, and I'm curious if you'd be willing to share a little bit about your understanding of what it means to be with someone uh, 
who's a culture keeper. Um, yeah, as someone that also youth look up to. Sure. Well, you know, it's it's funny, but when I when I came out to San Francisco um, back at the very end of the eighties, when I came out here, I had lived most of my life in Oklahoma. So most of my life from from the time I was born till I till I grew up. I, I grew up in Oklahoma. I represented my tribe in various ways and very capa various capacities, even um, even representing them uh, while going on trips and um, and speaking speaking ab about my tribe and our tribal mm -hmm. ways. And so when I came to California, you know there is there's sort of this thing that you expect out of elders of giving advice and advising you and telling you what's traditional and what's not, you know. I feel like I've been doing that since I got to California, even e even in my youth when I got here, because there are so many people that came here through the Indian Relocation Act. Um, yeah. Dylan Myers, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. who was head of the um, BIA, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, created this thing called the Indian Relocation Act. So, uh, so we have like a lot of descendants of. Of, of indigenous people that are out here in these urban areas that are not necessarily connected to their tribe um, yeah. of, of what I think of back home. So, so there are people that are within my tribe and, and similar tribes, Southeastern tribes that are very similar to me. And I've been able to, you know, tell them, oh, well, this is what we do. And this is what it means. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's very important that you that you don't just do it, but you also understand um, what it means. And one of the things that I've always done, even though I was never told to, it, it was just something that my 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 grandpa he used to wake up every morning. Um, you know, when the roosters started calling, he'd he'd wake up and 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 he'd sing his prayers. Mm -hmm. So, as as a consequence, I have kept that to myself too of of, mm -hmm. of doing prayers every morning. And, mm -hmm. and and what that actually has done for me is it's helped me to retain um, more of the Chickasaw language than 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 you would think. I've I've been away from the Chickasaw Nation for so long, but through prayers, I still um you know I I still have that um, fluency because because in a way I left, but I never really left either because I have these prayers every morning that sort of like you know you have to search for words sometimes when. When, when you're praying in Chickasaw. And mm. so it and and so yeah, I, I've been able to maintain some of my culture. So I, I sometimes say that, you know, I left Oklahoma, but you know, just because I left Oklahoma didn't cease the Chickasaw within me. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. my, my Chickasaw has remained and, and mm. it stayed there. So mm. so I'm I'm still connected. I go back to Oklahoma all the time. I'm I'm still connected. And I think our ways are very important. And so so I try to keep them. As, as as much as I can. It's not always mm -hmm. easy when you're up in an urban city and, <laughs> and things are different. You know, like for instance, you know, our tribes, the Southeastern tribes, we're not really what you would consider powwow tribes. Mm -hmm. But a lot of Chickasaw people do take part in powwows. And being in an urban area, you're more likely to go to a powwow than you're ever going to be at a stomp dance because right. no stomp dances out here. So if I want to go to a stomp dance, which is sort of the religious practice that um, we as um, Southeastern tribes do, mm -hmm. I have to go back to Oklahoma. And 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 I don't really have a choice um, unless somebody comes out here and does an exhibition. You know, they'll mm -hmm. do an exhibition and that's not quite the same. It's not quite the right. same. An exhibition stomp dance is not the same as a stomp mm -hmm. dance. You know, there's there's no prep. You you just jump up and you dance. <laughs> um, but when you go to Oklahoma, there's there's steps. There's there's different things that you do, and so I think it's very important that um, that I as a person inform my relatives, especially the southeastern people, um, what I think that they need to know. Or mm -hmm. what they what they want to know more than need to know because need mm -hmm. is a big word. Mm -hmm. um, what they want to know, if they want to know. Then then I'll tell them and I'll help them with it. And mm -hmm. sometimes even if they don't really want to know, I'll just share it anyway. <laughs> um, it's 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 one of the things that I I really enjoy about some of our gatherings is being mm -hmm. able to 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 share the food that we that that we mm -hmm. have as well because our our food sometimes also 
considered medicine in many ways too. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not just about like having a great flavor, but it's also the medicine that's uh, that you're presenting for your community as well. Yeah, I was thinking about um, you know the gathering again this this summer, and there was a, a group of young uh, two spirit identified people that you had sort of had a little bit of to do with them getting there. It was you know Morgan, um, your nibbling that was from Oklahoma, I think that came. Um, and I, I just so appreciated that you are actively building community for young people in this way. Um, I see it. And I'm just, you know, wondering about like, how is it for you to be, you know, Auntie Landa now? Um, just too many of us, you know, now you've, you've, you've you know, I, I asked Auntie Stephen this last time that I did a panel. Um, I was just curious about like, you know, now young folks are calling you Auntie. What's that like for you? Well, First off, I would like to say that I think that um, my relatives should stop having so many. Because <laughs> <laughs> these are the, these are the, 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 these are my blood relations. These uh -huh. are my actual relations. <laughs> but, but but I will say that I feel good in in many ways because you know, in in some ways they could easily say that I was the first to come out, mm. and 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 so it's it's made it easier for them. So, so when they came out, they're um, uh, telling their parents, they thought their parents were going to be mortified and destroyed and everything else. But instead, they were like, well, there's me, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, I already set like, um, I, I already sort of set like, like um, a good path for them. And it 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 makes me proud. It makes me proud that they they've had an easier time. Mm. Um, I can't say that it was a perfect time because you know no one ever has like a perfect coming out story. Really, um, it's 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 just something that happens, and and so they've had a difficult road, but at least it's been easier and smoother be, mm. because uh, because I was there before them, and how it feels to be an auntie, I feel like I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> you have no choice wow okay um, like eventually like eventually once you reach your 50s you're just sort of like well <laughs> I'm an auntie to everybody now there you go there you go well I think I, I I think primarily in in the gay community once you hit like what was that magic age once upon a time um looking for everybody up to the age of 27 oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> many moons ago many nobody moons. wanted somebody 27 or 29 you know they had to stay within like the younger things and um nobody wanted people who were in their 30s but um but yeah once you move move past all that you just you just naturally accept that you're going you're going to be an mm. end someone so my only advice to to people as as you get older is to um keep stock mm. In how crazy you were when you were younger mm. because that'll keep you from being too judgmental of, yeah. of 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 the young people that are up and coming yeah well you want to have about 10 minutes left together and then we are going to open things up to a q a so folks that are with us tonight live if you have some questions for land lakes uh please feel free to drop them in the chat and we will get to those in just a moment Earlier tonight, you mentioned uh, ICWA and MMIW, which are two issues that are impacting the entirety of uh, what we call Indian country, but native people across uh, the US, um, which does of course impact Two-Spirit folk. I'm curious if there are specific issues or, or additional issues that you think also uh, impact our community that um, you may wanna use your opportunity now to share with the folks to bring to their attention. Um, other, uh, other items, uh, other political items? Are you could be political items, could be, you know, like, hey, February 4th, we've got this great big powwow coming up. Really anything that you might want to share that you think is, um, you know, folks that might be interested in learning more about Two-Spirit folks or Two-Spirit um, things that might be going on across Turtle Island. 
Well, sure. If you're if you're interested, November 25th, we're going to have an all indigenous show at um, SF Oasis. That's right. In San Francisco. Um, you can go online and find our event bright and everything for that. But it's called Indigenous Brilliance because we want it to be bright and lovely. And, and we ask the question, what does it mean to decolonize um, drag yeah. when, when inherently a drag is a Western concept. So yeah. what does it mean? So we're gonna find yeah. out what the performers say about that. An, an, another thing I would say, just to um, to go back a little bit to ICWA yeah. is, is just the importance that people think about it in terms that it is about sovereignty mm -hmm. more so than anything else. Yeah. It's not a racial distinction, it is it's it's about our sovereignty as a nation to be able to control where our where our children where our children go, and yeah. I I think that's a very important distinction to make. Um, once you start breaking down all these pieces of sovereignty, because we have lost a few things in 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 the past, um, specifically with sovereignty, and 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 that's a very important issue for us. We want to continue to be a sovereign nation. We should be accorded the same rights as any state mm -hmm. as well. So that's right, that's right. I always think it's interesting. As far as I, if I understand correctly, Indigenous peoples in Canada can travel on their uh, cards, their identity cards. Whereas in the U.S., it certainly doesn't work like that for us. Like you know, if I were to roll up into say some place that wants to see my ID and I pull out my tribal ID card, most places are not going to know what that, that is. Recognize that as like a, a, an actual. Uh, document that we could use to identify ourselves in, in that way. So we're forced to, you know, con conform to those uh, colonial ideologies of passports and uh, driver license and those things, you know, so. Do you know what's really funny about that is that you cannot use your uh, tribal membership card. However, you could use your uh, CDIB um, at, because it's, it's, it's issued because it's federally, um, whereas, whereas your tribal ID is, is, um, is issued specifically by your tribe, but because the CDIB is issued from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, okay. um, then, then you can use it except for the fact that it has no picture attached to it. So, <laughs> right, so, right. so if that's the ID document that, that you're going to use has to have a picture on it, then right. forget about it. Right. So, so, so that doesn't, so it doesn't even work that way. But I, I think it's really cool that Canada Canada affords a lot of different things, and mm -hmm. um, a lot of that has to do with their treaties. Yeah. Whereas, whereas our treaties were not quite as as encompassing on that. Yeah. I, I I wish it were, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's it's, yeah. it's CDIB CDIB card for folks that don't know. A certified degree of Indian blood is what that stands for, and that is the uh, the BIA Bureau of Indian Affairs way of continuing to track and monitor Indigenous people to this day. So. Um, yeah, that's what that stands for. And, you know, we, over our time at various gatherings, a lot of these gatherings that happen up in the Montana area are international gatherings. So folks from what we now call Canada will oftentimes come down. We met a great group of Canadians this summer, and I've been following their adventures on uh, social media. And I, I keep thinking, wow, y'all get together a lot. Uh, it seems like y'all have a lot of gatherings. That's so nice. We need to do more of that on, on this side of that imposed border. Um, which we do have a Bates powwow coming up on February 4th. I want to stress that to everyone that is going to be held in San Francisco, uh, February 4th, which is a Saturday and um, at Fort Mason Center, uh, which is, I don't know, can't remember the exact address top of my head right now, but it's uh, down by the Marina. It's an amazing location. It's a free event. Everybody is welcome. Um, if you can make a donation, wonderful. That's great too, but we will have tons of vendors and it's our first in-person public in-person event really since the pandemic uh, for the Bay Area, uh, Bay Area American Indian Two-Spirit Organization. And I've no doubt we're going to have an amazing event. And we will also have some virtual programming uh, leading up to the powwow, which the past couple of years we've been doing that. The drag night that you have hosted has always been a huge hit. And I don't want to put you on the spot. I should have asked you this in the powwow committee meeting, though I was hoping that there may still be another uh, drag performance that's part of either the virtual programming or something the week of the powwow. Any plans for that? Yeah, we're we're thinking about um, about bringing that into uh, the night before. Wonderful. So so it'll be live slash virtual. Oh, oh, a little so both. Oh, love it. Yeah, it, it it'll be a little bit of both. 
Um, but hopefully as, as we plan this out and everything, um, it, it will all take place at our, our big get together. You know, years ago, I wanted to call our get together a gala, but people were like <laughs> a little too gay. Uh, and so now we call it the pre powwow social because it <laughs> sounds so much, so entertaining. <laughs> That's a nice, nice flow to it. That, that one does. Um, uh, I, I, I do love that. Um, so just a few more moments before, um, uh, just got a note about, we're gonna move into Q and A in just a few more moments. Um, I, I do wanna just ask you though, a bit about, um, well, really two questions. The first is, do you have any words of encouragement or advice that you might offer uh, to Spirit Youth that may be listening right now, or maybe their friend will share this with them, who might see you and say, wow, I can be big and beautiful and bold when I get older as well. Um, and maybe see someone like myself and see themselves represented in a different way. Uh, but really the res kid or the kid that is in the urban environment that maybe doesn't have access like you and I do, anything that you'd like to sh share with them tonight? You know, that's that's really hard to speak on nowadays because we live in a completely different world than yeah. we used to. So a lot of times you'll see a lot of like two-spirit um, res kids on TikTok doing makeup that's and right. makeup that's transformations right. and everything else. So, so I, I don't know if there's a lot out there anymore that really feel as, as, as closeted as say, mm. say when we, we were growing up. It's it's a different world. Um, so at this point, I would probably say that for all of you young people who who are out there who are still closeted, um, remember two things: everybody has their own timeline. Mm -hmm. So there's there's no pressure for you to come out, especially if 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 coming out actually does mean that you you might end up being homeless, because a lot of people may not realize this, but there are a lot of Christian households out there in, in the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think of like um, native people as being like, you know, these traditional ways sort of people. But when you look at, say for my tribe, my tribe, we're about 90% Christian, Same. Same 90%, way. that's that's a lot. We had a lot of missionaries throughout the Southeastern tribes. Mm -hmm. So so there's a lot of Christianity out there. So for those kids, you know, all I can say is like, I'm. I'm 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 sorry, but at the same time, you know, you you have to come out at, at your own time. Mm -hmm. So don't feel like people have to push you into mm -hmm. into coming out. And and for those kids who um who may not be in that same situation, just remember that um to be to be proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. Pride is such an important thing. You know, we we spend so much of our lives feeling like we um we might embarrass other people and it's it's hard for us to be ourselves and so so that would be my advice remember that to have pride with, within yourself and pride is vanity pride is just being able to um mm. to speak the truth and 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 be comfortable with who you are beautiful i appreciate that thank you for sharing that so my final question to you is it is native american heritage month we get one month um, I think we get it. Do we get a? Do we get something else? Um, I can't remember if we get if we get any other months or times or places, etc. We we get a special day actually. A special. Oh, that's right, the day that one day. Thank you. And yeah. and for two spirit folk, oftentimes that day, Indigenous People Day, falls also on National Coming Out Day. So wow, it's close. Indigenous Peoples Day is in October, but this month. For the month of um, November, we have um, National Native Heritage Day, which oh. is the day right after Thanksgiving. That's right. Right. Okay. And it's Thank the day you. that we're going to have our drag show. <laughs> Wonderful. Was that oh. purposeful? That it's just sort of natural yeah. that way. Yeah. Okay. It was. It, it was very purposeful. Um, it, it was. It was interesting because the the management at Oasis actually reached out. And, oh. and and said that um, I guess they had already had something planned, but then that that had fallen through, and so they offered it to us, the indigenous community. Wonderful. And so and so I said yes, and well, so I think it works out that way. That's how that, that that's how that developed, and so I'm I'm very appreciative of of Oasis to to reach out like that and to cool. uh, to, to be able to do more than just say we recognize you know that this is Indian land, but to actually yeah 
actually do something for us as well is yeah. it's pretty remarkable. And props to CIIS public programs as well for having myself and Landa here tonight, giving us this opportunity. Uh, so final question to you, Landa, um, given it is this Native American Heritage Month, uh, what is it that you hope that our listening audience tonight um, maybe takes away from our time together tonight about two spirit people? The one thing that I would like people to take away is, is, is to remember that two spirit people want to be a part of their own culture. They do not want to distance those, themselves from their culture. They want to be a part of their culture. Um, and, and, and that's very important because I think that um, so many times two-spirit people are sort of pushed out. They're, they're pushed out and then, then they end up in a big city and they just sort of disappear and become invisible in that big city. Nobody knows what you are. Like when you, when, when you as a native person meet somebody, unless you have like, you know, really big full braids and so forth, they're probably not going to know who you know what you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so, so a majority of, of indigenous people just sort of disappear in big cities. And, and so that's one of the things that, that I want people to know is that uh, two-spirit people are, are visible, they're here, and, um, and, and they want to be a part of, part of their own culture. Mm. And, and, and that's really what, what we are hoping to do every time we go out is uh, to remind people that we can be proud of our own culture. Mm. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, we have some questions. If um, And if you have more questions, please uh, share them with us. Um, so I'm going to start here with a question from the audience. Thinking about the future, what would be a near perfect, perfect future for, near perfect, perfect future for two-spirit people and Bates in particular? If there were no limits, and no barriers, what do you hope for, for both? What would I love to see with Bates? Mm -hmm. I would love to see our, our, our Powell get even bigger. Mm. So, so when I say that is like, you know, you, you have several Powells that go from like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that, that go forward. I would love to see that first week that we call our kickoff week continue to grow as well. I would really like our powwow to, to become one of the largest mm. in the United States. And wow. that would be amazing. But, but mainly what, what I would really like to see is, is more dancers, mm. more dancers coming to our powwow, more dancers, more drums, you know, it, it's, it's what makes the powwow what it is. And, and we always have dancers, but wouldn't it be incredible if we just had all these dancers that, um, identified in a multiplicity of ways and they all came to our powwow um, yeah. dance. I, I think that'd be pretty amazing. I would love to see a grand entry that was uh, that was just like, as it is, the grand entry is pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah. But I would love to see a grand entry where it's just packed. Mm -hmm. That would be amazing. That yeah. would be amazing. What do you think needs to happen in order for that to, for there to be more dancers, bigger powwow, full like week of programming leading up to it. What do we need? I think that, uh, to be honest, the, the one thing that we need would probably be really great publicity. Mm. And, and we are a grassroots organization. So mm -hmm. we would definitely need, need the funding yeah. because, you know, a lot of people that do the powwow trail, they do it, they don't really make a lot of money. Um, while doing the powwow trail, you know, they'll, they'll win at certain dances and stuff, but you don't always win, but the, the prize money that you get from, um, fr from dancing sometimes will take care of the cost of your travel yeah. to get there. And, and we know San Francisco is expensive, mm -hmm. but people traveling from, from out of town and out of state is like a major expense when you think about like hotels here costing like 200 to 300 dollars a night so it's it, it's very expensive so yeah i would love to see our our prize money go up as well mm -hmm. um if 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 we had that if we had the publicity and if if we had the money i think we could do it, it mm. would, and and it'd be amazing it'd be amazing 
Yeah, that that sounds amazing. I mean, thinking of a three a three day powwow sounds exhausting and incredibly exciting at the same time. So I hope that becomes a reality someday. I know whenever we start uh, promoting the powwow, folks are always like, "Is it one or two days this year?" It's like it's always one day. It's always been one day. We'd like to do more, and it's it's all that we got at the moment. Because you're right. I mean. The powwow in and of itself is completely grassroots. Um, this is a group of really a small group of individuals that work really, really hard for free uh, to put this event on. Um, and we do get public funding uh, grant grants for that. And then we take uh, donations the day of. Um, and it has been uh, really, really cool to see the powwow just grow in the 12 years that it has grown from that space within the LGBT center, which could, it was, at, you know, reached standing room only capacity. It was quite amazing every year until we got to Fort Mason, um, where we always outgrew the space and arguably even Fort Mason, you know, could, could use some configuration to make that, that arena even bigger. Um, and that's, yeah. that's what we're doing at the moment. So we, we were very fortunate with that very first powwow that we did because um, when, when we invited people, we didn't expect so many people to come. And and so we we had one space there at the LGBT Center and and it, it filled up relatively quickly, so much so that like we were very appreciative because like one of the people that was like connected to us um, actually worked for the LGBT Center at the time and they were able to um, start setting people up on the different floors. So in a way, we sort of like took over the LGBT wow, Center for, awesome. <laughs> for, for that day. and. And every year it was it was sort of like, you know, we we went across to the East Bay one year because that was our initial plan was to go from San Francisco to East Bay to San Francisco to the East Bay each year. But we went um, that second year and we got a bigger place, but it filled up again. Yeah. And so and, and so once we started like having like an, at these bigger places, uh, our third year also we did it at Soma. That's right. So our space. And mm -hmm. it, it got full again. Um, we barely even had like arena space for, for all the dancers because it, it, it got so full. Um, so I, th I think really it wasn't until we hit Cal Palace and then from Cal Palace, we went over to Fort Mason. Fort Mason. We really started having room. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so here's here's to more growth um, and, and more growth for all two spirit powers. I think it's all great. We have a question from Lavender wanting to know what resources are available to individuals that know they carry indigenous blood, but have no ties to the community. As an example, they say, I'm adopted and was told I am one eighth Native American, yet I don't know anything about my birth parents or heritage. Hmm, that'd be really tough. I mm -hmm. guess like that really depends on um, the adoption agency and everything else. Um, however, if you if if you want to join the native community you're you're still able to do so you you can still come out to all the different events that that, yeah. that we put on um there's nobody at the door checking your uh checking your tribal identification no. so so feel free to come um we're we're pretty welcoming we we welcome all people so yeah you're you're still able to come um we can't we can't. Well, we may not be able to help you find your specific tribe um, that has to do with your adoption papers and everything else, um, but we can invite you in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I hope that's helpful, Lavender. And um, you know, really for anyone that's that's listening that that may have native identity or maybe recently did a DNA test or something, just know that th there are ways that native people think about um, community and um, belonging in ways that uh, do not necessarily uh, line up with a DNA test or something. You know, we have different ways of welcoming people in into our communities and into our spaces. I really, really appreciate what you said, uh, Landa, about come on out anyway, come out anyway. You will find folks who may have had similar backgrounds or experiences that you do uh, that will be welcomed and loved back to returning into the circle. Uh, another question, how do members of your tribe and or family respond to you and the Two-Spirit community? My family responds very positively. Um, it hasn't always necessarily been that way. I know that like my my aunt that I'm closest to, um, 
she's always been like really, really close to me. Um, I think there were a number of years that her Christianity really um, mm. was was such a such a big part of her life that um, that we didn't speak for a while. Mm. Um, and I think it took that one of her grandchildren um, came out as as to spirit mm. that she sort of changed and now we're extremely close again mm. but um but yeah i mean like it's, it's 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 not always easy and it wasn't always easy in my family um but for the most part i've had primarily positive experiences and even the experiences that i thought would be very negative have not proven to be mm. so they've they've been pretty positive and like i said as a result you know members of my family who have come out later on have had had a much easier job. Mm. Yeah, because you know, I as I was reading that question, I was like, yes, Landa is um, openly to spirit, and you're visible. <laughs> you're not just like you know, you're oh visible God. in the community in Indian country. You've you've gotten national attention. You've gotten press. So in a lot of ways, it's like th there is there is the persona of Landa Lakes, and then there's also. Um, I don't want to say Miko as a perform. Uh, 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 I don't mean Miko as a persona. I mean Miko, Miko, who also gets a lot of great, amazing press and attention for the work that you do in your activism role. So you know, even even that visibility, I think, adds this other layer to your story. Well, you know, it's 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 funny you should say that because like so many of of the people that I went to OU with, University of Oklahoma, um, I I went to school with. I was I was very fairly well known to be um to, to be we, we didn't use um we didn't use two spirit back then mm -hmm. but um I, I was a very definitely a member of the gay and lesbian alliance and and so people all knew that and i, I was very obvious um i could never really hide mm -hmm. I, was, I was extremely obvious and you know probably putting the ponytails in my hair probably wasn't like the best <laughs> <laughs> the most masculine thing I could do in the world. Um, but yeah, I think that um, that that I've met so many of those people all these years later. And one of the things that they have quite often said was that they were afraid of me <laughs> during that time oh. because, because I was so proud of who I was mm. and, and, and I let my little light shine um, that they were afraid to be around me. Hmm. Hmm. No, but I say be who you are <laughs> be who you are I love it uh question are there still a lot of barriers between keeping the western values away from being blended with the indigenous values like needing a U.S. ID license etc hmm that's a that's a tough question. Um, I mean, like we live in the modern world. I think that one of the things that, that that you have to think about when you think about indigenous people is 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 that we are a part of your world, but we have a separate culture outside mm -hmm. of it that 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 we are attached to. So so yes, we're going to do everything that you do in your daily life, and plus on top of that, we just have this culture that that also exists with us. So blending of, of, of Western values, however, has been have been in existence since colonization. I mean, that's the whole yeah. point of what they call colonization. Um, I think that I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand what colonization is. So I'll I'll just say it very simply. Colonization is is when you bring your laws, your rules, your values, the essence of of who you are from another country. And you go into a different country and you keep those values and you don't blend them. That's what colonization yeah. is. Yeah. So, so when the British came to the United States, before it was the United States, just um, the land of North America, when, when they came here, they brought their British values with them, their laws, their rules, and they expected Native people to function underneath them. And that's what colonization is. And so and so when we talk about decolonization, we we're we're not talking about like, you know, 
kicking all the European people out. What we're talking about is returning to our values and, and returning to the things that were important to us once upon a time. We can't go back in time. We can't become those indigenous people we once were, but we can change our values. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, following up with that, there's a question that says, Landa, would you say to a young, I'm sorry, what would you say to a young urban indigiqueer who is hesitant to claim a two-spirit identity due to feeling too assimilated to Western culture? And how has living openly as two-spirit been part of your decolonization journey? Okay, so you're you're an indigenous person that's not really connected to your indigeneity. Well, in that case, I would say that um, you're the first thing that you need to do is is come into community. You you have to come into community and 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 be recognized by the indigenous community that exists here. This urban an, an urban area wherever you're at, there is an indigenous community somewhere. So go and find it, and and that's how you become. That's how you become a part of it. Um, even, even if you feel scared and feel like, you know, they're going to question your identity or something else, you know, you, you still have to come in. And, and the truth of the matter is that um, being Indigenous is, is, is very, um, how should I say, uh, very instructive, hmm. meaning that, meaning that um, Indigenous people are going to say, we're going to pray now. We're going to create a spirit plate. We're going to, they tell you what they're about to do. So mm. almost all protocol that, that, right. that, that you'll ever have within the indigenous community is announced. And, and so you already know that's going to happen. Just don't go to a place where they're serving food and just start eating. <laughs> <laughs> Remember to wait. And also some of the food that they, they may have out is is a spirit plate so don't eat from that either um, and let your elders go first <laughs> <laughs> um so how has how has being two spirit played into my decolonization yeah mm -hmm. well i would probably say that growing up in growing up in oklahoma i've always had two value systems to begin with mm. you know just just the american value system and the indigenous value system so, so those have always existed for me. So I don't think that two spirit really, really had anything to do. Mm. With that. Mm. I think being indigenous and, and, and just, just living my life in, in both of those, those specific cultures um, is, is enough. And, and when we talk about like decolonization, um, if, if I have indigenous values already, that does not have to be decolonized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, I was thinking about that, that, that earlier part of that question around, um, you know, someone that may identify as indigiqueer and not sure if they can identify as two-spirit because they may be tied to uh, more Western ideologies. You can be both. You can be two-spirit and indigiqueer. You don't have to choose. You get to be both. That, that's the beauty of being um, two-spirit is that we don't have to choose. We get to be whatever and however we want. So you can celebrate both identities because the indigiqueer, for those that are Listening is a relatively newer term that sort of post uh, two spirit, and now now a lot of folks are using indigenous queer as well, which I actually really like. Even though queer was such a pejorative when I was a kid, um, I like indigenous queer because it it to me it's like I get to reclaim this word in a way that feels more in alignment with who I am. Um, in addition to two spirit, which I think is uh, also how I identify. I like both words. I think they're both great. It's it's so weird to me in some ways because of the fact that like when back in back in the eighties and early nineties and everything when um, when we were starting to use the word queer, um, it 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 usually meant that you know we were like sort of like radical sort of like you know we're taking this term back and we're yeah. going to use it you know queer nation you know <laughs> um, and and nowadays in some ways indigenous queer is sort of almost like the opposite. The mm. indigenous queer is like um, saying, yeah, I fall in the umbrella, um, but that doesn't mean I have to be political. <laughs> <laughs> possibly. I'm not going to get into that with you tonight, but possibly that's one way to interpret it. Um, but here's a question. Oh, um, the name of the playwright, Hane Gigama. I don't know how to spell that. Who was the name of the playwright who worked at UCLA? 
That was one of your inspirations. That is Hane Gigama. Yeah. Do, could you not spell Gigama's last name? Oh my god! <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you if you phonetically try to type out Hane Gigama and uh, playwright indigenous into Google, it'll come up. Um, very well known in the indigenous theater world and, and the playwriting world. Um, here's a question. We have a, time for a few more questions regarding pronouns. I've heard some individuals say that pronouns are from colonization and that some culturally don't use them. When someone does not use pronouns, is it best to use a name each time referring to someone or is there a linguistic term that is used rather than pronouns that would be appropriate for someone not from that culture to use? Oh, that is so complicated because mm -hmm. like, you know, we, we, you're, you're dealing with like a lot of languages that are like, you know, um, English and Latin based and all that. And those, those depend upon like, you know, she's and he's and hers and stuff. Um, my tribe doesn't use them. My tribe doesn't use uh, feminine and masculine uh, pronouns at all. We don't use them. Uh, if, if you're speaking Chickasaw, you know, you're either Sa, Chi, Li, but that's about it. You're mm -hmm. not, you're not really um, a, a he or a she. Um, so I think that with, within, within that terms, okay. But in English, I don't know. I guess you would continue to use all, all these other things. I think that when we fall into like the pronouns and everything else, unfortunately for me, I'm just not as up to it as maybe you you would be better to answer that question, Roger. Um, because I, I have certain relatives that are they and them, but you know, we live in American society, so we're far more likely to use he, she, they, them than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I have gotten into the um, uh, practice of uh, communicating with just someone's first name, even if I, even if I don't, um, especially if I don't know their pronoun, um, and even sometimes if I do, um, I've just gotten into the practice of, of using names, so I don't know how helpful that may be to you, audience member. Uh, I do it all the time, um, where I will just refer to someone by their name until I know differently. Um, and I think that that's just, that's how I would say that, because you're right, the, the, the terminology is changing all the time. And um, I think as an English speaker who's so used to using those particular uh, pronouns, I've just had to practice. Um, and, you know, whenever folks, you know, uh, feel challenged by practicing, I would say, well, I mean, how many ways do you know how to say thank you? Um, and most people will say, you know, gracias, merci, danke. They spill out these German, French, and uh, Spanish. Where did you learn that? You learned that pretty easily, didn't you? You can learn this too, right? So it's always that way of like, if people are willing to pick up colonial uh, colonial terms from other languages, you can pick up new colonial terms from the one that you speak to. Uh, that's always my perspective around that. So one more question, Landa, then we are going to, actually two more questions. Um, then we are going to say good night to you and thank you. Um, are there any books or other media that you would recommend on the topic of two spirits? Oh, you know, I think that In the Spirit was like a really good book. It's it's more or less an anthology that that you can check out. I, I believe that's before the term two spirit was really- um, Spirit coined. in the flesh, you mean? Walter Williams? Yeah, spirit in the flesh, spirit in the flesh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that was that was before it was really coined. Yep, um, it was in the early 80s that book came out. Yeah, yeah. But other than that, I, I like experiences more so than, <laughs> than, than books. Um, sure. Roger's, Roger's the academic here. I'm, <laughs> I'm not interested in reading about two spirit people. <laughs> I'm I'm more interested in just being my person. Sure, sure. Well, I'm interested in reading and writing about them. Um, and I would say, hey, if you can come take my class at San Francisco State University, Native Sexuality and Queer Discourse. Otherwise, there are some phenomenal books out there, some phenomenal films. Um, Wildhood is one of the most recent ones that came out out of Canada. Fire Song also out of Canada. A lot of great uh, two spirit films being made and produced in Canada. Uh, but there are also a lot of uh, amazing um, experiences, such as the upcoming Spirit Pow Wow and the upcoming Brush Arbor Girl performance. February 25th, was it? November 25th. I'm sorry, November 25th. November. Thank you. <laughs> February. November 25th. And then, and then the um, uh, Weaving Spirits Festival that will debut in the spring. Um, and 
you know, I think TikTok is actually a really great place um, if you if you like hashtags or or Instagram hashtag Two Spirit hashtag Indigiqueer in TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, and you'll find lots of stuff because some of the older stuff that's available is written from a non Two Spirit lens. Uh, they may be allies, they may be white cis gay allies or lesbian allies, uh, though the majority of the earlier books have all been written by uh, white uh, anthropologists, ethnographers, uh, et cetera. So one final question for you. Um, this comes from Bridget. Hi, Bridget. And thank you, Corey, for your question earlier. Uh, what can I do to bring more attention to the things you are trying to accomplish? How can I help long distance? Oh, you can totally help um, through social media. Um, we, I, I often post things that are actually happening within the indigenous community, sometimes on, on my Instagram, besides like tons of pictures of myself, because everybody does that, right? Uh, <laughs> but, but, but I, I do post a, a lot of stuff about, um, about things that are going on. I just posted something about ICWA not, not too long ago. So, yeah, I saw that video. Um, so, so if you want to help out from long distance, just amplify that by, by sharing it. And 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 continue to share some of the things that are actually happening within within the indigenous community as well as the, the two spirit community because it, it affects us affects us all. Um, there are so many um, young two spirit people that are caught up in 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 foster care and um, boarding schools even even to this day. So yeah. so yeah, and, and amplify our voices when you see it, amplify it. Yes, that's beautiful. Linda Lakes, it is always an honor and a true joy uh, to be with you, uh, always in this capacity um, and always even more so when I see you just as a friend. So thank you so much for all that you shared with us this evening. Uh, congratulations on all of your successes recently. Um, and is there any final thoughts that you would like to share uh, to our listening audience today? My final thought is this, if, if 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 you really feel strongly for um, the two spirit community, if you're indigenous, make sure to have a welcoming space for two spirit people. If if you're not indigenous, um, then make a welcoming space for indigenous people as a whole. And and remember that we're not we're not all gone. We're not invisible. We're there. And sometimes it's it it might take a little more for you to. Um, to find out who we are more than anything else. So just, just make a welcoming space. Thank you, Landa Lakes. And thank you to the California Institute of Integral Studies for having Landa and I here this evening. It has been a joy and an honor. And I would like to invite Alex back into the space. Mado, thank you, thank you, thank you. Alex, take us out to the outro, please. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded tonight. So if you'd like to watch it again, or you wanna share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this same link and later on our Facebook page. We will also be featuring this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your night. Mm -hmm.